right here, actually. How are you feeling? <laughs> no, it just won't display it out. And hers did it for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start up again. Uh, one of the reasons that, that we wanted Bill to go first was because he really lays out, um, I think as, as well as anyone, sort of the ecological destruction of the planet. And then one reason that we wanted Jane to go second is because I think she, better than anyone, lays out sort of the mythological underpinnings of that destructive behavior and alternatives. Um, I'm gonna do the whole have you read this book again. Anybody near, how many people have read Age of Sex Crime? Absolutely crucial book. It's, it's, um, It's, it's a st stunning exploration of uh, the um, ways that women's bodies are used, are cut up by <coughs> patriarchy. Um, can I try the one sentence thing? Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Very. My, my, my one sentence version of the book is that it makes the connections between how serial sex killers mutilate the genitals and breasts of women and um, how an unnecessary hysterectomies and breast surgeries and um, how women's body parts are cut up and used for advertising and how all three of those semicolon and how all three of those uh, manifest patriarchal imperatives to cut up the bodies of women. And the planet. And the planet. But that, it's a ritual. It's a ritual, it's a, sac it's a sacrificial ritual um, that not only draws energy serving the forces of destruction, <coughs> I mean it really is a form of blood sacrifice in contemporary culture, not named as such, that feeds the forces of militarism, imperialism, destruction of the planet, um, and that, yeah, so that, that is what I'm arguing in there. And that's why Jack the Ripper has become a cultural hero. You know, he, I mean, think about it, right? Um, I can go to a restaurant near where I live in Florida called Boston's, and on the menu, um, you can buy a drink called the Boston Strangler. And, right, like, what does that do to both you know, obviously trivial, trivialize violence against women, but just show that actually these, these men are heroes of the patriarchal culture, that they are playing God and that they are enacting the primary blood sacrifice that's keeping patriarchy going. Uh, you know, along with many, not the primary, many blood sacrifices. Um, but it's, it's paradigmatic, paradigmatically expressed through the murder of women. So let's go. Let's okay. go. Let's go with the regularly scheduled questions. Okay, now. regularly scheduled <laughs> questions. What is the meaning and value of the terms Mother Nature and Mother Earth? Right. Yeah, I brought up here an image of you know, Mother Nature from the ancient world. This is from about 5000 BC, and you know we hear about Mother Nature all the time, and often in this very trivialized concept. Although <laughs> religious studies scholars like Catherine Roach will tell us that that's probably the very oldest human intuition about the nature of being. The oldest religious intuition is the intuition of Mother Earth and Mother Nature. And um, I want us to think of Mother Nature not as, I mean, mothers are complicated, right, in our patriarchal culture. And many of us have complicated and sometimes traumatic relationships to our mothers. Some of us have very wonderful relationships with our mothers. I'm not really talking about, like, the personal mother here, although that participates in this larger force. but. What I want us to think about Mother Nature as is as a matrix, a principle. And it's a principle that is understood, I think, as the principle in the cosmos that allows being, or even what we might think of as spirit, to manifest in material reality. And it binds matter and spirit. And it's this process that we can understand of continuous rebirth. 
So it's the process that causes birth, growth, sustenance, but also wasting, aging, decay, death, breakdown, and then transformation. And that is the continuous process going on. So this mother not only births, but also takes everything back at death, transforms and brings out new. So it's this cosmic principle or process. And you know, what happens to Mother Nature? We, we still hear about Mother Nature, but look even at this contemporary ad for Tampax of all things, right? Um, in which cut Mother Nature down to size. So this Tampax is bigger than Mother Nature. Yeah, this is kind of shocking, really, right? And if you think about menstrual blood, right, which signifies, you know, that menstrual blood, of course, the power of life, blood is the power of life and the power of death. And menstrual blood is sacred in all human cultures, right? Taboo and deemed dirty and unholy in patriarchal cultures. But here, you know, it's this complete control over the processes. And they even call it the gift of Mother Nature. She's holding this gift and bringing to mind, and this could go way beyond my time here, but the gift economy as opposed to an economy based in um, deeming the earth and human beings, women, and people who are named as other as property that can be owned. But what, what did cut Mother Nature down to size? And it's another figure. It was actually in San Francisco that I found this image once in the San Francisco Examiner, I think when it still existed. And I think what this image implies, that's of course God the Father up there, is this rupture that created the kind of sociopathy in our culture or that emblematizes the sociopathy that Derek has spoken about. And I think what this signifies is a moment when a patriarchal ego separated itself from the earth, did no longer saw itself, as Bill was talking about, as being one, but as somehow separate and somehow transcendent. The earth is now just a thing, the creation, not the creator herself, right? But, uh, and we have this whole image of hierarchy, male domination, um, looking down over um, as a way of control, surveillance, objectification. And, you know, it's a, you know, what we get this in uh, David Levine, who's a political cartoonist, will show us really, you know, that men play that God, right? The, the powerful men who run governments who run corporations, pharmaceuticals, um, churches, right? Who conceptualize themselves as playing that kind of God with that kind of power uh, over others and who are in some ways effing the planet, right? And, and treating the planet as a passive rape victim, if not ultimately the victim of a gynocidal murder. And I look around here and you see this kind of, again, this image of playing God. This is an image from a 16th century manual for Spanish explorers, really conquerors, of course. And we can see him with his like hand on the earth, right? And of course, re reversing the real proportions, right? The earth is much larger and bigger than any of us. But this kind of, we see this everywhere. I, I look at mythologies and how they're expressed in popular culture. And everywhere I look, I see mostly white men holding the planet, right? <laughs> uh, big surprise, right? Um, and in every context, education, domination, medicine, technology, you name it, handle with, oh, isn't that a hideous image really? Of this kind of terrible sterility. Um, even like in environmental or green thinking, we'll sometimes see, and here we have a woman of color holding the planet, but I still would warn us against this kind of um, <coughs> motif, right? That we, and I think this reverses, and I want to go back to the idea of the Earth Mother and Mother Nature. You know, love our mother, uh, something again that makes us kin, something we all share, and remind us that actually, in most indigenous thought, and the thought of really any kind of green consciousness, it is not we who hold the Earth, but the Earth who holds us, right? It's a huge reversal. This is Frida Kahlo, the loving embrace of the universe. See the universe behind the Earth there? The Earth, Mexico, myself, Diego, and Mr. Shalotl down there and her dog. But, you know, the universe, Pachamama, right? The greatest cosmic force, who is in some ways the most mysterious, the Earth. But that we are all held on her lap. So I think that's the much more ecological image. And of course we find that kind of image all around the world, even in Christianity, in the Black Madonnas of Europe. And remember, these are not family portraits, right? These are... Um, really complex metaphysical 
um, concepts, that what we're being directed to is the lap, right, of the mother. Um, a Lakota saying is that we all rest in the lap of the mother. We all sit in the lap of the mother. We find this in thought all around the world. The paramount importance of the lap of the mother, where we are held. And that lap signifies that matrix, that cosmic principle of rebirth all over. So it's not a family portrait. It's really a, sta a statement here about the way the cosmos works. Um, and we see this in contemporary art as well, of the large <coughs> mother. But if we look at how the earth is again pictured in contemporary imagery, yeah, the best, and this is for some kind of healthy eco juice, right? The earth as if being strangled, right? Squeezed out. What does this mean? I mean, what kind of attitudes that we take in unconsciously? And every kind of image I can find of the earth being mistreated, I can find a parallel one of a woman being abused. Um, again, they're saying, save the earth from human ruin. And it really, of course, looks very much like Jack the Ripper, right? Again, attacking. What Jack the Ripper did, he didn't rape anyone. He attacked women, um, prostitutes whom no one cared about, of course, who were seen as professional scapegoats or victims, sacrificial victims, and tore out their genitals and sometimes carried away even the uterus. Um, again, that, that attack on the cosmic matrix. Um, we see the Earth as if it's just, you know, completely plastered over with, with money as an item of exchange. The same thing, uh, that women are as something that can be owned, bought, you know, taken with cash. Um, every, every image I see of the Earth that in some way suggests a power over and possession of the planet, I see of a woman, um, the Earth cut up as if it could be fragmented, penetrated, um, all these common images we see of women as false, as simulated, as mannequins. The earth as if it could be shopped and possessed, right? And we know what shopping is, of course, that uh, endless consumption is doing to the planet. Um, and this is Victoria Beckham, like Pose, and this is supposed to be to honor her, as if she herself were just put upended into a shopping bag. And no, nothing against Victoria Beckham, but, you know, that image of like, that cultivated upper-class white image of almost starvation, right, for women, um, that I find, like, I'll go back to Christmas Eve in the Boston Globe. I've never forgotten this image. This is a famine in Ethiopia. And I'm sure the photographer posed this woman by the side of the road. The child was dead within hours of having the photograph taken. But to look like the Madonna and child and the child on her lap, and on the right, we see Weinberger, Ronald Reagan's press um, secretary of defense, saying, we're going to go with Star Wars. It's the only thing that gives hope, right? Which is ultimately feeding the military machine, right? But she's dying. This is an image even beyond the horrific colonialist tragedy of what was happening in Africa, but of a wasted Madonna, right? This is of the earth being destroyed, really, transmitted. Um, but we're told to put our hope and faith in Star Wars. So rem remember the body of the earth, the abundant body of the earth. So maybe we have, and, and, and the other images out there finally are not, are just of the artificial woman. But going back to where we started with how the female body represents this cosmic <coughs> force. And I would say other bodies certainly as well, but in some primary way, the female body represents that earth body, all bodies really. But, and how increasingly though, the emblem of what's happening to the earth is in what's being done to, to women's bodies, made into machines, completely simulated, fragmented, and ultimately, you know, this figure, um, you know, this is, a ver this is beyond even the wasted Madonna. This is like, um, this is a sterility goddess, right? This is the promise of the cessation of rebirth. This is the most dire image of apocalypse, and it's selling us vodka, I suppose. So we drink it, and we drink, drink that down at the same time. So um, what would be the relationship of, of the relation between hatred and violence against women, uh, gay people, Native Americans, blacks, other stigmatized groups, to violence against modern human nature? Right. Well, we notice, let's just see. And I'll get to this in a minute. We, we notice, of course, that in any, in any oppression, you know, we have this othering. We see that the patriarchal God removes himself from the earth and from nature, 
right? He, he's transcendent, he's above it. And any group that identifies itself as superior usually says, I am culture, I am culture as opposed to nature, I am up as opposed to down, etc. And any oppressed group is seen as more nature. And the oppressor extracts uh, themselves from nature. So that's certainly one of the connections we can think of right away, that all oppressed people are seen as women or, or gay people, gay men as well as lesbians, are seen as sex, just pure sex, no mind, right? Um, that um, colonized peoples are seen as dirty, as savage, as closer to the earth, as backward, even as matriarchal, right? Which supposedly means that you're closer to the earth and therefore lower down on the scale of evolution. That's certainly what the social Darwinists thought. And um, I see this beginning, again, in a mythic moment of goddess murder, where, you know, this is like from the oldest written down creation myth of what was Babylonia, really now, which is contemporary Iraq, of um, Marduk, a young grandson god, who kills his mother, Tiamat, who is his grandmother, who is a serpent goddess. And she had a husband. Often in the oldest mythologies, the principle of nature is, is also seen as in combination with a male principle, who she is, you know, the male is something of like part of this greater whole. In Mexico, you had the ancient lord and lady of duali duality. Tiamat's husband was absent. But like the grandson god has to kill her off to um, establish the ascendancy. And out of her body, he creates matter. So this is the original degradation of matter. Um, we even see in front of the United State Nations this myth still being told as good defeats evil. So you get this um, paradigm put into play where everyone associated with the darker, subjugated, sexual, natural, dirty side of things is not only seen as inferior, but really targeted as someone to wage war against in the service of goodness and light. And certainly we saw that in the conquest of the Americas by the Europeans. I would recommend Andrea Smith's book, Conquest, in that regard. Even she looks at like soap commercials and how Indians were seen as filthy, dirty, and you know, soap. And you could look at soap now and see all kinds of fascist ideas around who's clean and who's not. I kid you not, go look at soap commercials. Um, whoops, I have to go back, sorry. <coughs> see if I can figure this out. Can somebody help me? When I have to do it, it's, uh, I don't know how to do it on the Mac. Uh, left arrow. <coughs> Left arrow. Down, lower, down, lower, 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 right corner. Down, down. Thank you. I think this is, yeah, okay. So for example, a couple of years ago, there was going to be a gay pride parade in Jerusalem. And all of these men representing the Abrahamic patriarchal religions got together. They put aside all their differences to get together to stop that gay pride parade. <laughs> Um, which they didn't, and they said, we must stop these people from into coming into the holy city and dirtying it, right? What is dirt? What is dirt? Dirt is soil, right? Dirt is earth, human. The word human comes, it means from Latin, dirt, earth. So we are all equally dirty, and actually the dirt is good, right? Soil is exactly what is holds the principle of the life force. Um, and as Alice Walker says, but when the earth is treated like dirt, so are many of us, right? Those who are allied with the dirty side of things. Here's another one of the more hideous ads I've found in which this woman of color is put out on like these zebra sheets because of course she's animalistic and animals are of course dirty and lower and all of that. And it even says, like, they're, they're trying to be so-called ironic, but how to control wild animals. And the script down at the bottom talks about how she's a generator of waste, and you put her in a cage, and the cage gets filthy. I mean, it's really that, that explicit in their language. And any kind of enslaved, any uh, enslavement, colonization, ethnic cleansing, right? You see the same dichotomy taking place. And it's, again, it's part of that purging or cleansing of everything that is seen as natural. It's part of the, the genocide, gynocide, ecocide is conceptualized as a purification or a cleansing kind of movement in some ways. If we wonder why it attracts the kind of fervor, it's not just about destruction to some of them. It's about the good, the purification, the cleansing, the further elevation of that kind of disembodied ego. 
This is um, an image from when that Amsterdam oil producing company, I can't remember the name, it begins with a T, illegally dumped all that toxic waste in um, Ivory Coast. Do you remember that? And like this was a dump, you know, so that's what you also do to people who are named dirty. You take all your toxic waste and you dump it on them, right? They're dirty already. So I, I see these kinds of patterns of like who gets named as dirty and who doesn't. And of course, in these dumps where they're illegally dumping, of course, poor people who are also named dirty are scavenging, right? To find the means of sustenance. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute, but, or should I just go on? <laughs> you notice I got going. <laughs> I mean, I presume that this that this goes to the the question of um, what kinds of already popular images influence us to teach us to worship violence against uh, domination, disrespect. Yeah, thank yeah. you. You want to say it again, Derek? Yeah, I'll say it again. Thank you. Um, and by the way, when people look at the DVD of this, I would really recommend that you focus on the actual language that you didn't read of that text. I'm yes. close enough; I could see it. If you go back. I want to yeah, read that. It's I terrible. can provide that. It's too. terrible. This one. Yeah. We all want to save a world, so come on, let's build more zoos. Yes. Thousands of them. Right now, there are far too many dangerous animals running around, wasting space, wasting time. Using, using the, planet the planet as a toilet. As a toilet. <laughs> Take our advice, don't be fooled by natural beauty, quotes. Stick them in a, stick them. Yeah. Uh, in practical, easy to clean metal cages. Why do we laugh though? Because it's ludicrous. I don't know. When you've been on the uh, the uh, targeted end of it, yes. it's hard to laugh. You know, I, yeah, it's selling jeans, and I think they would think that they're cool and hip. Edgy. Edgy, right? Like that Victoria yeah. Be Beckham had was all saying how edgy, edgy, edgy. edgy. Um, yeah, this is about. This is, of course, you know, the question is, what kind of popular images? And I'm showing you lots of popular images that sort of recreate this ideology. But this is one of um, Perseus killing the Medusa. And the Medusa, of course, was the Greek goddess with hair of snakes, who, of, of course, epitomized. And her, she had very powerful blood. The blood from the right side of her body could heal you. The blood from the left side of her body could kill you. Which means, of course, that she was the cosmic life force, right? <laughs> that process of continuous birth, life, death, rebirth. Um, so but he killed her, of course, because they can control everything, even life. And look at the sword, of course, the phallic sword right there. And I really want us to think about the ways in which men and the male body are conceptualized under patriarchy, which must deeply alienate men from their bodies, their sexualities, their psyches, of course, depending on the level of how much one buys into it. And again, I could go on and on about this, but I just have this one choice image from details a men's magazine. Why isn't your wife ch um, pregnant yet? You know, you, you could be shooting blanks. But in, the idea here is that the penis is a weapon, right? And then every time a man has heterosexual intercourse with a woman, he's doing the effect, he's basically being Jack the Ripper with a gun, right? And, and shooting into her. And like the whole ways that a patriarchal construct, culture constructs men as violence objects, really, and takes the penis, which is as frequently soft as hard, right? Well, more frequently soft than hard, right? <laughs> Unless Viagra has gotten totally out of control. But, uh, I mean, what is this idea of the phallus? Like that god we saw in the beginning, that patriarchal god, is the phallus. He's called the omnipotent, right? In the Catholic religion that I was brought up in. Always potent, always hard. This image of masculinity as deadly, really, because most akin to a weapon. And if something is in a permanent state of hardness, right, it really denies the male body as being part of nature, right, as, as phasic, just like women's bodies. And also as, and I'm just going to show you this image. This is from um, the documentary Paris is Burning. And this is Warner McPherson, also known as Hershey Ultra Omni, in his, um, his self-presentation as he walks the runway. And he's, he decked himself with all these beautiful flowers, right? And think of that, coming from one of the most uh, discriminated against, reviled, all we'll hear about, like just what we heard about happening in New York where these men kidnapped these three gay men and tortured them, right? Including 
raping them and burning their penises with cigarettes, right? You've read about this. Um, you know, that's what comes out of that kind of patriarchal ideal of masculinity, and this resistance to any kind of masculinity, gay or straight, that would counter that. But how much more lovely to think of the male body and the penis, even in particular, as a flower, right? Um, so there, are, there would be alternative ways of conceptualizing bodies, female, male, animal, um, as outside of this patriarchal paradigm of domination. So how does patriarchal religion contribute to disrespect for and violence against the earth? Um, patriarchal religion contributes by dispiriting the earth and the world. Um, you know, we talk about the destruction of the forests. Well, remember Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh destroyed a forest. He went in, he was seeking immortality. So he went in and destroyed a forest. And to do that, he had to kill the forest daemon, our word demon, which means wicked and evil comes from a word that really means the spirit of a place. Because all places were inspirited, all places, all natural phenomena have a soul or a spirit. And he had to go in and decapitate the spirit of the forest and then kill it, believing that that would give him immortality. Because again, once you conceptualize yourself patriarchally, you're the ego and the ego cannot die. The ego has to extract itself from this process of, they're terrified of death, right? So they create mega death. But this idea that they will survive, including in the technological idea of like, I'll download my consciousness into a computer or something, right? I mean, how creepy zombie is that, right? I mean, it's completely necrophilic, right? Necrophilia, not so much in loving natural death, but in separating oneself from the cycle of life and death. You know, loving this sort of state of permanent undeath, right? So. Yeah. I just want to point out that um, the forests that he cut were cedar forests so thick that sunlight never touched the ground, yeah. and that was Iraq. And yeah. when people think of Iraq, they don't right. normally these days think of cedar forests so right. thick that sunlight never touches the ground. Right, right. And then, of course, what, what happened in Europe was the Christians deliberately cut down the sacred groves. They could deliberately cut down the trees because the trees were the places where people gathered to do alternative ritual practice of earth reverence. Um, they made it literally church policy to cut down oak trees and sacred groves, to kill. St. Augustine hated the forest daemons. He talked about them with their filthy and obscene lust. And of course, earth worship, earth reverence, included sexuality, right? It wasn't confined to pornography or made, you know, moralistic dirtiness, right? Um, sex and spirit were together. Right? What's more erotic than the earth, right? The flower, the mud, the smell, the green. I mean, that is the source of all eroticism. But patriarchal religion says, you know, separates mind from body, sex from spirit, makes all that dirty, and directs all that ant antagonism then toward the earth and toward the sexual body. Um, so do you want to talk more about why we think of sex as dirty? and how that's related to disrespect for bodies of the earth? We we'll probably could move on from that. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, though, is that um, I always thought that one of the reasons that the patriarchal God is so nasty is because he's lived forever and he doesn't have a body, which means he's never had an orgasm. Right. I <laughs> agree. You know, like six billion years is a long time. <laughs> long I know. I know what. I know everybody hates bodies. You know, it's like Absolutely. they get to have them. You know, people mouse get to have them. I don't. Right. I mean, that god came in. You know, we've all talked about the sex goddess, right? Um, but there really were. I mean, the patriarchal god had to take over and displace the patriarchal god's rival was the sex goddess, somebody who really had a body, right, and who experienced continuous orgasm, perhaps, right? I mean. You know, in that kind of coming and becoming, right, is what is the joy and process, the ecstasy of life. That was what was celebrated in the sacred groves, for example. Um, so, you know, they replaced this bodied, sexual female um, who also incorporated the male deity with this all male, erotophobic, bodiless, orgasmless god. Well, and before we get to the next question, there's another thing that has struck me about the whole omnipotent God, which is he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, 
and he's still jealous. Yeah, so I know. Wait, you, I think we need some like cosmic therapy. Some envy. <laughs> yeah. I agree. It's an envious God because and he's the only God. Yeah. So he's the only one. He's omnipotent, omniscient. He's still jealous. I know. <laughs> There's a lot more going on here, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so why is cleansing a metaphor for genocide and other atrocities? And how is sexuality exploited to provide energy for oppression, including violence against the earth? And get as cosmic as you want. Yeah, I'll pick up on that last part because we talked about cleansing. But I just, I just did some. I just wrote an article talking about the ongoing murders of women in Wa Sierra Juarez in Mexico, and looked at like the the way that the blood sacrifice of patriarchal cultures. I mean, including the European conquest, which was a form of blood sacrifice against indigenous peoples. But you know, the Aztecs, who of course were a deeply urban patriarchal culture, um, you know, did all this blood sacrifice. We know about like ripping out the heart and all of that. And when they murdered, they often murdered, you know, they murdered men and women. But when they murdered women, um, they were deliberately trying to take energies associated with the earth and with women and channel those into the military. That was like what they thought they were doing. And I think they probably were doing it. I do think there are energetic transfers. I do think that patriarchal men do blood sacrifice to try and to separate themselves from this matristic, matrixial, right, the matrix, that cycle of life and death. And um, I think they, they do that to, to feed, literally, the war machine and to cement their bonds with one another. So I do think there are energetic transfers going on and that, you know, we, we need to understand that we have to disrupt those rituals in all ways, understanding all the dimensions of the what, what's taking place. Well, before we get back to this, I would like to go further with that, which is that um, one of the things that really clued me in or that really made me very confused for many years was that there were something like 49 attempts made on Hitler's life and many of them failed for reasons that were like a Monty Python skit. One of them failed because a fly landed on someone's hand, literally. Um, and many of the plots were extremely well planned out and how it, it can't, it, it, it seems to me that it couldn't have been just luck. And one of the things I came to is, you know, six million Jews and several million others and 20 million Russians, a lot of blood sacrifice to combine you a lot of help from someone. Um, and I've asked the same question about why did the dominant culture keep, why, why has it kept winning, especially when indigenous cultures are explicitly allied with many forces that help bring life. I mean, obviously there are the mechanical reasons that we can talk about, you know, building warships, big guns, um, atrocities that other cultures are entirely unprepared for because they've had no experience with someone so ruthless or so filled with lies um, but how do they it's like this this is it's great we're having this today because uh, what is today the 17th 18 16 16 so four days ago was the anniversary of the worst day that the Americas have ever suffered and one right. of the worst days the planet right. has ever suffered and what a lot of people don't know is that the crew mutinied a couple days before and said, we're going home, this is ridiculous. And Columbus said, give me two days. And on that second fucking night, you know? It's like, if it had been one more night out, they would have turned back. And we can talk about Cortez conquering the Aztecs with 150 men. We can talk about smallpox going the wrong direction. Um, you know, Jared Diamond has explanations for that. but. The point is that somebody's gotten awfully lucky yeah. so many times. I, I tend to like not really, I, I, think it, I think that their gods are projections of their own egos. So I'm not sure there's some cosmic force helping them. You know, I, I wouldn't go there. That they, I think that they, they make that sacrifice to try and manipulate energy patterns, I do agree. Um, but I think that also points us <coughs> to ways to stop them um, in that 
I think it's really important for us to disrupt their, you know, that's one reason why the Catholic fathers burnt all the witches, because that they, what the, what the church said was that what witches did, and we know what witches, witches were, of course, ancient herbalists, midwives, pagans, right? Women, right, who the church wanted to get rid of to like not only take their property, but to like, you know, exert that kind of domination, sacrifice, pave the way for the new professionals of medicine, etc. But anyway, what the church said the witches did was interrupt the wave way lengths through which men communicated with God, through which God communicated with men. So there's this idea there that we can interrupt those wavelengths, right? And that we can know how to do it. And I think it's really important, along with all the other activism, and people are going to be talking about strategies and activism, it's all part of, part of you know, our work. But part of it, I think, is to um, really make acts of active disbelief in patriarchy, in racism, in homophobia, and, and do it publicly and in ways that are intended to, like, take back the energies. Few, you know, it's like in The Matrix. Remember how, like, the humans were put, think of the movie if you've seen it, I'm sorry if you haven't, but humans were, were kept in this state where their energies fed the machines. Do you remember that? I mean, our energies are feeding this machine. They can't make their own energy. They are reliant on our energy. And so if we take the blue pill or the red pill and we wake up, we don't necessarily want to get machine guns and stuff like in the movie, but we withdraw our energies from the system. And I don't mean that just in sort of the new agey, nice, I, I would like to help think of strategies to actively do that. We know that when the Christians took down the Roman Empire, which they kind of did over a few centuries, right? One thing, one way they did it was by refusing to participate in public avowals of allegiance to the Roman gods. And that was just, the Romans were hysterical about that. So I would look at that. And I think the other thing we need to do, um, this is, I'm going to skip these right now because no time for today. But, um, I'm making a film based on all this, so I hope you're going to want to see it. But, um, and Derek and I talk about this a lot, that we are, I'm going to quote Susan Griffith. Oh, can I say something about October 16th? October 16th is Mary Daly's birthday. Some of you know Mary Daly. She died last January 3rd. Yeah, my greatest teacher. And uh, I really basically owe being able to think to her and many others, but... She was my first teacher when I was an undergraduate at Boston College who really woke me up, opened my eyes, and completely rocked and transformed my world. So I want to honor her today, uh, the day of her birth. I think she would have been 83. Be wrong. But she died last January. But she, and, and she certainly did this as well, and Derek and I have talked about it, that we have to stop thinking with the mind that got us into this mess. And Susan Griffin talks about this that as well. I'm almost quoting her there. And one thing that patriarchal or this dominating culture does is it discredits some of our ways of knowledge and some of our ways of accessing the knowledge that we need. So it adopts this hyper-rationality and tells us that nature can't speak and we can't hear it or we can't talk to trees, right? Which is what they were doing in those sacred groves, talking to those spirits. Of course, they believed in them enough to cut them all down, right, the trees. Um, right, right, but they're real, and we have to like start acting like they're real. I, I know that, um, and we have to listen. And you've certainly talked about that in your work as well, right? And heard, right? You've, you've asked a tree, and you've gotten guidance, as as have I, or a bird. And I think in dreaming, and I'll stop what I'm talking about today because I'm probably about out of time. Five minutes. Um, I think it's really important to activate our powers of dreaming and vision. And I know maybe not every dream we think is really, but sometimes I think that is the way that the universe gives a specially big shout out to us, right? It is, Greg Cajete says in Native Science, a natural way of accessing knowledge from the earth, right? Dreams. And all peoples have known that. Not all of our dreams, maybe, but some. I had this dream once where I went to a s above ground, like, mass transit place and suddenly there was a stair going down it went into another world and people there didn't really like humans that much they knew what a problem we were but 
you know, I got, they let me go, and I went, and suddenly I was in this country road, and there was um, outside, completely verdant countryside, and coming out of the earth was this spring of just ultimate greenness, and it sparkled, and it was green. And I put my hand in it, and I just felt the most enormous flow of ecstatic energy. And then suddenly I switched, and I was in New Mexico talking to a friend of mine. I used to live and teach there. And this was somebody from one of the Pueblos. And I said to her, what does it mean? And she said, feed the green. And it means that we're not just, we don't just take from the mother, right? We have to give back. I mean, really, literally. We have to also nourish the earth. We have to give back to the earth. And like, there's a whole tradition around the world. And this is some of the work I'm doing now. But here, Isis was the green Isis with the child on her lap, right? All these green deities around the world, the green man of pagan Europe, right? Um, even in our popular culture, Poison Ivy, right? From the Batman series, who's all green. And green Tara. And I guess I would just like to, at least my, my last statement on that is that I think we need to activate, we get such knowledge that patriarchy desperately keeps trying to discredit from dreams, from the perception of synchronicities, from what we call intuition, from our actual ongoing dialogue with nature and with each other in our gathering and our collective displays of disbelief in patriarchy and affirmation of devotion, really, to the earth. That seems like a good place to stop, but I would like to ask another question, um, which is a question I get a lot is, so yeah, Derek, you say that the tree told you to write this, um, and you're talking, you're encouraging people to listen to their dreams or to listen to trees. How, a question I get all the time is, so how do you learn to do that? within this culture that teaches you, having not been taught to do that from a, from a youth and been not taught to value that, right. how, how does one decolonize in that way and how yeah. does one, how do you personally, uh, how have you personally learned how to listen? And I don't think I'm as good as, it, as I should be because I'm as enmeshed in you know, technology. I mean, one thing we have to do is get away. Did you notice all those screens that were in there, all those squares? Lame deer, from our actual ongoing dialogue with nature and with each other in our gathering and our collective displays of disbelief in patriarchy and affirmation of devotion, really, to the earth. That seems like a good place to stop. It does. But I would like to ask another question, um, which is a question I get a lot is, so yeah, Derek, you say that the tree told you to write this, um, and you're talking, you're encouraging people to listen to their dreams or to listen to trees. How, a question I get all the time is, so how do you learn to do that within this culture that teaches you, having not been taught to do that from a, from a youth and been not taught to value that, right. how, how does one decolonize in that way and yeah. how does one, how do you personally, uh, how have you personally learned how to listen? And I don't think I'm as good as, it, as I should be because I'm as enmeshed in you know, technology. I mean, one thing we have to do is get away. Did you notice all those screens that were in there, all those squares? Lame Deer, in his book, talks about how we have to get away from all these square screens that we're looking into all the time, right? And go back into the round, right? So in some ways, obviously, we have to go outside. <laughs> <laughs> which we are encouraged more and more to be inside and in the virtual world more and more. So literally, but like you have to know the spirit of the place where you live, right? You have to go, you know, you have to like make those steps to, um, and I know that like Thomas is going to talk about this later, like the kind of activism and the kind of knowledge about your community. The New York Times the other day did these <coughs> 10 communities that have done major environmental shifts, and you know what section of the paper <coughs> put it in? The style section. I guess it's women and gay people who are doing all this, right? <laughs> because that's where it was. But anyway, so and and also yes, we we have been trained against this. We all did it as kids, right? And Mary Daly, who uh, I'll I'll close with her then. She would say the way to do this is to go back to your elemental memories. You know, if you however what can get you, go outside, lay on the ground go back to your deepest, earliest memories and like really ask them to teach you. 
you know, call out and, and cry out, really. Thank you. Okay, thanks. for being here. So we're going to take another five minute break.